Live from Prince Edward's Island, it's Worm Talk, starring your host, Dunkelzon, the dragon, telling you all you need to know about the Sixth Age. With your guest. Enough of listening to these dragon lies. I've got the most whiz interviews coming at you beneath the electron skies of the Matrix. Here we go. All ones. Lou Prosperi spent many years working in the gaming industry as a freelance game designer and writer, as well as a product line developer for FASA Corporation, where he where he is well known for working on the Earth Dawn role playing game. After leaving FASA Corporation, he worked as a um, designer. Uh, my script actually wrote out there. Is, would you like to introduce yourself? So sure, <laughs> sure. So uh, my name is Lou Prosperi. Um, as, as Matt said, I uh, spent some time working as a freelance RPG designer um, before getting a job at Fast Corporation, where I was the product line developer for the Earth Dawn game. Uh, after leaving that job, I went into the field of technical writing, which is what I still do now. I did a little bit of game design freelance work after leaving um, FASA uh, for the, the in the following two or three or four years, but I haven't done much active game work in many, many years. And I still work as a technical writer and manager now. And more recently, I've written a th trio of books, three books about applying Disney Imagineering to other creative endeavors. And we could talk about that a little bit later if we want. Oh yeah, um, but, most definitely. Um, but for now we can, you know, we can start with the gaming side of things. Uh, would you like to talk about how you got into game developing and uh, game design? Sure. So it started, you know, as most people, but uh, as a player, I first got involved in role playing games uh, in the mid 80s with the DC Heroes role playing game published by Mayfair Games. Mm -hmm. uh, I was an avid comic book reader and I found uh, an advertisement or notice about the game and I went and found it and the game. At the time, the Teen, New Teen Titans was a very popular comic, and that was sort of a focus of the game. And uh, that was, again, my first introduction to role-playing games, and I sort of taught myself how to play and game master at the same time. So I was mm -hmm. a new, I didn't play before becoming a GM. I started as a GM, which is a little bit different experience than lots of people have. Um, I, I, As I collected all the different products, I noticed that there were different names on all of them, and I couldn't it didn't make sense that they all worked for the company. And so I called and found out that they use freelance writers. And so I wanted to learn about how I might be able to do that. And so I got involved in play testing as a start. I, I play tested some um, early modules in the DC Heroes line. Uh, one, of the, one of the modules of a four part Legion of Superheroes series that they had mm -hmm. published. And I, you know, I started writing up short little articles or character write ups for their newsletter, doing play testing. And when they were publishing DC Hero Second Edition, I sort of got involved as a playtester of that. Um, and then um, I had also worked with Mayfair in terms of arranging, um, helping arrange a tour um, for them to come to some local game shops and demo their things. And they mm -hmm. they needed somebody to help demo games at a convention in um, 1988 at the International Superman Exposition in Cleveland. It was the 50th anniversary of Superman. Oh, wow. So they invited me to go there and help run demos in their booth. And then they invited me to go to Gen Con with them to help run demos in their booth. And while I was there, I asked the president, I said, I wanna work for you. And he, they needed somebody in their warehouse. So my first job in the game industry was actually the warehouse manager at Mayfair Games, shipping out DC Heroes and Roll Aids products and, uh, City State of the Invincible Overlord and Empire Builder and the board games that Mayfair was publishing at the time. Okay. But that got me involved in the in the development side a little bit on DC Hero Second Edition. Uh, I helped write the stat. There's a book of character stats. I helped write that with Jack Barker and Ray, Ray Winninger. And then um, while I was there, Mayfair had acquired the rights to chill and started to look at that. Um, in the meantime, I lost that job. I left that job and uh, moved back home, get another job, but stayed in touch with the game developer folks there. And when they were working on Chill, I sort of acted as a bit of a consultant, um, did a little bit of design work. Most of my work on Chill was about um, 
save the the organization that the characters all our player could characters you, work for. Could you tell game? us a little bit about that? So I don't know if you're familiar with Chill. Chill is a horror role playing game originally pa- produced by Pace Setter Games in the in the early '80s. Uh, again, in the late 80s, Mayfair Games picked it up and published a second edition. Um, they hired a gentleman named David Ladyman to who worked on, who worked with Steve Jackson, did a lot of design on GURPS products um, to work on the main edition. And I sort of worked as a consultant, play tester, uh, helper. And again, so in Chill, it's a horror game, but the, the premise is that the characters work for an organization called SAVE. And SAVE is an acronym for a, a Latin name that a Latin phrase that I don't remember off the top of my head. But um, in the second edition, we wanted to sort of shake things up and, you know, save was just this good guy group. So we wanted to shake things up. So we sort of revealed that save was sort of created as a, as a result of an accident that its founders caused. They caused some bad stuff to happen to let more horror monsters into the world. And so they cried it created it out of guilt as a way to sort of help save the world from the danger that they brought to it and that was sort of what we tried to introduce in the second edition with some um we we i added the idea that the save headquarters in i think it was ireland was attacked by the monsters of the unknown or creatures of the unknown which is the name they used for the monsters in that Mm. game sounds a little earth dunny well a little bit yeah (laughs) so when they um when they were in the and the the mansion headquarters burned when they were excavating and cleaning up to rebuild they found the secret vault that they had never found before with all these records of the founders and they discovered that again um they had been playing with forces beyond their control and partially contributed to more monsters being accessible in the world and so save was sort of part of this way to sort of uh, you know help save the world from the mess that we created you know Mm -hmm. um and we also created had this idea of originally um in save there were good guy powers um envoy powers i can't remember what they were called exactly but there were you know psychic mystic powers Mm -hmm. that player characters could get and then the monsters had powers that were called evil way disciplines in second edition and again this was the late 80s coming into the early 90s um I think the influence of of dark stories, like even in comics like Watchmen and Dark Knight, had sort of started to pervade, be more pervasive throughout different pop culture. And so, this whole you know sort of dark history thing was sort of uh, interesting and intriguing at the time. So, we had the idea that that maybe player characters could learn disciplines of the evil way, evil way disciplines, and learn to use the bad guy powers. But we wanted there to be a price for that. Like if you went too far, mm-hmm. sort of like, sort of like in Star Wars, you know, using the dark side of the force, that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. Um, and so, in uh, in the chill game, we introduced the various chapters with a pair of narrators, and one was named Robert Alexander Davidson, and the other was named Rax. And Rax was a monster, and Robert Alexander Davidson was a save envoy. Um, the secret truth, I don't know how secret it was. I don't know if anybody ever got it or cared, but they were the same person, basically. Oh, really? Rax is Robert Alexander Davidson after he was he succumbed to the evil way and oh, became wow. a monster. And so we use those two voices to sort of introduce things. Um, and we worked with Ray Winninger actually wrote the text for both of those guys. He wrote the voice, he was the voice of Rax when we introduced him. So um, that was a kind of a fun project to work on. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And then around the same time, I had started to get into some other freelance opportunities. I um, So the main designer of DC Heroes was a gentleman named Greg Gordon. Mm-hmm. And he, after working on that and some other things, he went to West End Games and he worked on the Star, Star Wars role-playing game, but he also worked on a game called Torg. Mm-hmm. which was their um, sort of multi-genre universe hopping kind of game. And I reached out to Greg and, and did some playtesting of that. I, I helped playtest many of the Cosm books. So the various, in Torg, these alternate realities invade Earth and take over parts of the world. And so mm-hmm. in North America, there was the living land, which was the sort of primitive dinosaur land. In Egypt, 
the Nile Empire was there. It was a very pulpy area. In France, it was the cyber papacy, which was sort of um, Inquisition style um, religion, but with with cyberpunk and um, hacking and that whole cyberpunk feel. In England, it was Isle, which was the fantasy land, fantasy realm. And so I started uh, as a play tester for that. I play tested, play tested in, um, with my group, you know, guys I mm -hmm. kind of came up gaming with. Um, we play tested a bunch of those. And along the way, I got to freelance for them and do some writing for them. And the first couple projects I did, which were really the first sort of credited freelance um, projects I worked on were uh, short adventures in a, an uh, adventure collection called Full Moon Draw. I wrote a short adventure about uh, for based on the living land. And then I wrote one based on Aurorsh, which is the horror realm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I also got into some other writing by, because that was with West End Games, I got into writing some Star Wars stuff. I wrote a product for the Star Wars role-playing game called Kraken's uh, Wanted by Kraken, which was basically a um, a list of bad guys in the Star Wars universe that you know game masters could use as as antagonists in their games. Um, and then uh, along the way, I also got, made some connections with some folks at TSR, uh, in particular Bruce Hurd, who used to coordinate the freelance effort. At, he you know was the main freelance coordinator at TSR, um, and so. That led me to working on a couple of projects uh, on, for D&D, &D, for AD&D &D at the time, AD&D second edition mm -hmm. in particular, I, yeah. Um, and that those included um, a book, a, an adventure collection for Greyhawk called Treasures of Greyhawk. Could you tell us about that one? I'm sure a lot of, there's a lot of Greyhawk fans out there who'd probably be interested in hearing about that. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that was a long time ago and I haven't <laughs> looked at it in a long time. Um, but I, so when I got into games in, you know, with DC Heroes, I bought everything I could find. And even though I was only playing that game, I started buying other stuff. So I bought, I had a complete collection of the original first edition Forgotten Realms campaign set. Oh, wow. The gray, the gray box and all of the supplements that I bought. You know, I didn't understand the game mechanics, but I knew the setting and I read mm. the setting stuff. Um, and I got to the point where I was, you know, buying a game book every week, you know, once a week I'd go, you know, I got my paycheck and I'd go buy a game, you know, on my way home from work. Um, I, I can't sympathize with that at all. So I, <laughs> you know, I had amassed quite a collection at one point, I think it was up to like at one point, 1500 books or something like that. Um, most of which is no longer in my collection, but um, so I, I was, you know, I, I wanted to do this as a, you know, I wanted to get into game design and I felt the right way to do that was to read as much as I could and study how, mm -hmm. you know, how do these different games work? And uh, so I was familiar with, the, you know, the general um, Greyhawk backstory and things. And and the, the short adventure, I think I wrote two or three of them and two of them ended up in the book. And I think one for reason, for whatever reason, didn't make it in the book, but I think they were going to turn it over to the RPGA and use it perhaps is there or, or something. Yeah. I don't recall exactly. Um, but they were, you know, quite honestly, somewhat tangentially related to Greyhawk. They weren't steeped in deep, deep, deep oh. Greyhawk mythos. Um, but it was still, it was still a fun project to work in as sort of a new thing. And then the other project, project I did for TSR back then was I contributed to the Monsters Compendium for Dark Sun. Yeah. I'm a huge Dark Sun fan. It's my favorite D&D setting. Could you tell us a little bit about that one? Sure. So um, again, and I had collected Dark Sun from when the time when from when it came out, and you know the early products had that very, very different production. They had these little stand up flip book things, and mm -hmm. uh, but again, it was the Monsters Compendium. And so this was in AD&D Second Edition. You probably remember the Monsters Compendium was a loose leaf binder, mm -hmm. and the 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 compendium supplements were collections of loose leaf pages that were punched, three hole punched. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I worked on, again, I was a contributor to the, the Dark Sun Monsters Compendium uh, appendix, if you will. And some of the creatures I particularly remember, I worked on a creature called the Kire, I believe it's called, K-I-R-R-E, which is like mm -hmm. a tiger, like a four or six legged tiger. Um, a 
a four-legged tiger is nothing special, but I believe it was a six-legged tiger. Um, <laughs> I, I knew what you meant, but... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I figured, but as I said it, I realized, well, that's kind of stupid. Um, and then I also worked on the golems that were in that book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe the elementals, too. I, I got a pretty cool selection of monsters to work on. Um, and, you know, with the whole way magic worked in there, it was a little interesting to do. And because, you know, in a setting like Dark Sun, it felt like Earth Elemental should be not your standard Earth Elemental. So mm -hmm. we get to experiment a little bit. But again, I, it, I have not gone back and read it in a long, long, long time. So I don't recall a lot of details. Yeah, I'm actually kind of kicking myself for not putting it on the back, the, my backdrop over here, <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, so uh, after after working on the the D and D products, where did you go from there? Um, let's see. So I continued to do some work for uh, for West End Games and Torg. Um, I ended up writing a product called the Storm Knight's Guide to the Possibility Wars, which was sort of a player's guide and a background book that helped players come up with backgrounds for their characters and you know fleshed out some of the rules. Uh, did another short adventure. Um, and then I don't remember exactly the timing, but around then I moved into, I ended up proposing and getting a, a contractor to write a Shadowrun supplement. And I ended up writing an adventure for Shadowrun called A Killing Glare. And that was, that was a product that was inspired by and influenced by a friend of mine named Chris Hawley, who had this idea, he played in my Shadowrun game and he had this idea for these, this pair of of um urban brawlers named punch and judy and he wanted to do an adventure about punch and judy and we back we you know kicked the idea around and we didn't know what to do with it until we came up with the idea of th they were former shadow runners who had sort of retired from running but had become urban brawlers mm -hmm. and we had this idea that well, what if something in their past was coming back to bite them, which is a common Shadowrun sort of thing. Um, but it happens like their, their urban brawl team makes it into the televised championships and they're on TV when the hit is gonna happen. Oh, wow. And so the Shadowrunner players have to go in and sort of save them or help them. They become, through the adventure, they come to realize that Punch and Judy are good guys and that they should help them. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Shadowrun is interesting because even though the in many ways, maybe in all ways, the characters are criminals. They are still the protagonists. And I so, you know, and I believe, and I, you know, I think this is something I've talked to Tom Dowd about when we worked at Shadow uh, Facet together, yeah. that they are still the good guys in a, in a sense. It's you know? very much like a Butch and Sundance anti hero kind of uh, situation you have in Shadowrun. Right, right. So, so. The, in this adventure, the characters be, are motivated for whatever reason to save Punch and Judy, but they have to do it in the middle of a big urban brawl game. So we got to sort of play around with the urban brawl rules and that. And, and I did that right around the same time that I had gotten in touch with Greg Gordon again, who had moved on from West End and was hired to design this fantasy game for FASA. Mm -hmm. And so I started playtesting that. And I I think my group and I were involved in the second round of playtesting, so we got in pretty early. Um, and, uh, you know, I had <clears throat> provided lots of feedback and, and different ideas. And then when they needed an in-house developer, um, my name came up. And so um, when I was talking to, I think I was talking to Tom about the Shadowrun adventure, he said, hey, you know, we have this other game. Would you be interested in, you know, possibly joining the team as, the, as a line developer? Said, well, absolutely, I would. And so that's sort of how I got into FASA. Um, went out and met the folks there and interviewed um, and was hired. And I started at FASA in December of 1992 um, as the product line developer. And again, this A Killing Glare, I don't remember if I finished writing it before I moved out there or if I finished it while I was there, but it was very early in my time when it was when I was, I was an employee at FASA when it was published. Um, and I remember specifically um, some of the editorial folks coming to me to ask me questions about it. And I said, you got to talk to Tom. I don't, it's not mine. I can tell you what I wrote, what I meant, 
but Tom may have changed it and it's his product now, you know, like, um, uh, so I know that was, I know that was happening and I remember the office and the desk I was in at the time. So I, I know it was very early in our time at FASA. Um, but so I um, joined FASA as the line developer again in December of 92 and the game came out in May of 93. Um, and then I was at FASA in that capacity until June of 1998. And then, you know, as we go on, we could talk a lot more about Earthon and the products as we get into it. Uh, uh, yeah, you want to continue on or you want to go uh, into the games you worked on? Um, well, so I, I, that was the, the main thing I worked on at FASA. I contributed a little bit here and there, like because of the, so the developer, the game line developers were all in a shared office space. Mm -hmm. And so very often we would step, you know, push away from our desks and sort of coalesce in the middle and toss ideas around. Um, and that included when Tom, Tom Dowd was the developer. And then there was a period of, there was a period of time between Tom and before, before Mike Mulvihill took over, there was a period of time when a gentleman named Carl Sargent was supposed to take over. Um, but various circumstances way beyond anybody's control, uh, uh, intervened to prevent that from happening um and then when mike took over you know we would we we had to stay in touch in contact just to make sure that we weren't stepping on each other's toes too much i mean yeah. you know all i had to do was make sure i didn't kill any of the characters that he talked about so i couldn't kill harlequin and earth on product <laughs> i couldn't kill i couldn't kill icewing or dunkles on or you know or what we call who we call mountain shadow um but it was still fun to sort of play with those connections here mm -hmm. and there, you know? And then, um, you know, most of my work there was, was on Earth on, but I um, contributed to um, one product in particular. So we, we held a series of sort of uh, summits for the game where we brought in some particular creators, sort of brainstorm ideas. And um, that's where on the Earth on side, that was where Prelude to War was born. Was born. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the Shadowrun side, that's where Dunkelzon being like the president and Dunkelzon's will came about. Really? Um, and yeah, so Jordan Weissman had the idea it'd be kind of cool if if a if a dragon was president. And then from that it spun out like, well, what if the da dragon was a if he was president but assassinated? And then what does a dragon's will look like? And so we started, you know. <laughs> um, and I know I contributed. Uh, couple of the ideas I tossed out definitely made it into the will I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I'm the one who who had the idea of the ever-living flower which is an artifact from earth on being in the will mm -hmm. as well as a couple of the earth on easter eggs I think the I think the cheat the uh, fruit cake was my idea but I, I don't, don't recall I don't There's, remember the fruit cake in in Dunkelzon's will, one of the bequeaths is a, is the fruitcake that he and another dragon have passed back and forth for hundreds of years. <laughs> um, I don't, I've, it's been a while since I've uh, I've not through the kind of fun, but... and I, I think that was my idea. Um, one other suggestion that I think I tossed out at one point that became sort of the way was that when we we knew Dunkelzon was going to die, but we didn't know who would kill him. Mm. I. My memory is that I tossed out the idea, well, what if he killed himself? What if he sacrificed himself? And that ended up being the story. Oh, wow. Um, Mike, Mike might remember it differently, and that's cool. Um, but I know it, you know, a lot of this would start where, you know, I'd poke my head around my desk and say, hey, what if, what if this? And Mike would say, what if that? And Brian Neistel, who was the Battletech developer, but was still very involved, and mm -hmm. Randall Bills, who was sort of our assistant, our de department assistant, who now is in charge of Catalyst Games, right? Yeah. Um, we would all just sort of, hey, what if this happened? Or what about this? Or why would you do that? Or, you know, it was just, a, it was a very sort of open, like toss out idea kind of environment. Um, we also, uh, along the way, most of us contributed to the collectible card games that were based on fastest properties. Yeah. So at one point we had designed a Battletech game and, uh, but then Wizards of the Coast got in, came in and sort of did their own thing. And a couple of the ideas in the game sort of tie back to some of the ideas that we had, we had pitched initially. Um, and then the Shadowrun game, which was designed in-house by FASA, we had designed in the development group, we had designed a couple different iterations of that before, before uh, Mike Nielsen was 
center of the game that got finally published. Um, Cause it was hard to sort of figure out like it, one iteration of the game that we had um, almost everything. You know, so, you know, in trading card games, there's instance, mm -hmm. almost everything was an instant. And basically the, the, the players represented corporations and all the shadow runners and their equipment were just expendable resources that they could use. Um, and so it sort of tied into the Shadowrun world, but it wasn't quite the quite the feel that we ended up wanting. So, mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting. You know, some people were playing it like this is kind of cool, where basically you just spend your whole deck, um, almost, you know, because all the player like instead of drawing a spell, you might draw a Shadowrun and just throw him on the table, and then he is used up and gone. <laughs> you know, so everything was it was from the point read from of the corporation. So everything was just this resource that could be expended and used. Um, Interesting. I, I think I still have a few of the Shadowrun deck cards uh, or right. deck. Or the this it's. Yeah. I don't think I ever played it, but I had a. I actually had a the the final product you guys put out. I I had the cards as a kid. I think I still right. got them somewhere. See, it's it's weird when you say you had them as a kid because that was in my adult life. But that's okay. <laughs> well, I was getting into uh, I was getting into uh, Shadowrun and all this uh, mainly the classic games right around. About the time you started working there it sounds like about 92 93 yeah and then you know i think as i think back i i worked on some other stuff at different times like at mayfair i i did some play testing on some of the um uh they do a train game called empire builder and we had play tested the mexico expansion which eventually became part of the north america rails version of that game mm -hmm. um and they had done a bunch of literary games um you know games based on literary licenses and one of them was elf quest by doug and wendy Pinney, and they had done a first edition and they wanted to do a second edition is that based on the comic book yeah right and uh they it was an interesting challenge because the game the initial version of the game was a little bit cumbersome and the rules were kind of hard to read and and slog through you know very typical board game stuff mm -hmm. um particularly back then and um so we wanted to rewrite the rules, but they had already ordered all the components. So we had all the cards in place. We had all the components, the board, the pieces, everything was in place. We had to rewrite the rules using the same components, but streamline the game. So it was a very interesting challenge. And one of the things that sort of happened was um, a couple of the cards that you could play became more or less powerful in this version of the game, just because of the way the turn cycle worked. Mm -hmm. You know, like it used to be, I think originally it was you could move and act or something and we changed it to you could either move or act but then there was a card that let you do both so obviously wow this is more more important and more powerful in this version of the game you know so there were little things like that but that was uh another kind of interesting thing that i worked on in, in my history you know not related to earth on oh yeah uh, i'm interviewing for your whole career not just uh earth Dawn, but uh so uh so uh, we've talked a little bit about what you did with Shadowrun. Did you work on Battletech at all? No, I didn't do much of anything at all with Battletech. Um, well, I take that back. I did one piece. I, 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 was part, I was part of one particular piece of Battletech. And that was, you may recall at that time in the early 90s, there was a Battletech TV show, an animated TV show. Um, and uh, FASA and the and uh, I can't remember the name of the production company. There was an agreement with Tyco Toys to make toys based on the mechs, battle mechs from the TV show. Mm -hmm. And for Gen Con, for a fun event, we came up with a game called Toy Tech, where people could play a game of Battletech using the toys, the Tyco toys. And so we set up this area in our development office and we figured out the, the quote rules. You know, there, there weren't a lot of rules. Most of it was aim your toy gun at the other mech. And if you damage it that's the damage that the toy gets but there was a couple other things we had to figure out like you know was a was a um a hatchet man mech equal to you know a, a couple of the elemental suits mm -hmm. no obviously so we had to figure out a little bit of balance um so we sort of developed that and we helped run that several years at gen con that was sort of a big you know a very fun event and we we had a couple toys as prizes so, but that was that was a kind of a cool thing where the people would come and actually be on the floor and moving the toys around on the floor and shooting at each other. That um, sounds like a lot of fun. I'd, I'd have a blast doing that now as an adult. 
Yeah, it was that was very fun. Toy Tech was fun. And I remember very well, I can very clearly picture the section of the floor of our development office where we <laughs> tested it and designed it and did it. Um, but that was the that was the main extent to my participation in Battletech. I did not, it really wasn't my thing, and I certainly hadn't read, you know, the millions of words about Battletech fiction and history. Oh yeah, it goes pretty deep. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, so we talked a little about about Killing Glare. Yeah, uh, what else did you did you work on while uh, with Shadowrun? And um, that was the that was the main product I actually worked on there. So we were fairly dedicated at you know at FASA for the most part. I was the Shadow I was the Earth Online developer. Tom was the Shadowrun developer. Brian, when I first joined. Scott Jenkins was the Battletech developer. Then he left and Brian Neistel came in. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and again, Randall came in as our development department assistant, but he really worked a lot with Brian. He was a huge Battletech fan. Um, And so aside from that sort of, um, you know, collaborative free-for-all thing that I mentioned, we we stayed pretty focused for the most part. Um, So I, I had been involved and played Shadowrun from when it first came out. I picked it up at Gen Con of 1989 when it was released. I met uh, Tom and Sam. Sam Lewis was the president. Tom Dowd was the line developer at that oh. at that convention. Bought the the whole package and started to you know play it and get involved and do. You know, I don't remember much play testing, but I but I wasn't shy about tracking down a company phone number and calling and saying, "Can I talk to Sam Lewis? I have a question about the Shadowrun <laughs> release." You know. Um, which I think, you know, in the end probably served me pretty well because I was I was not a completely unknown quantity, you know, like, so. Um, and, you know, Shadowrun was a game that, another one of the games where I bought everything as it came out. So I had a pretty complete collection and I still have a pretty complete collection, um, including, you know, hard to find things like Bug City and uh, the original Denver set, which I see you have behind you. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm recollecting all the books I had as a kid that I had lost uh, uh, in transited right. life. Yep. yep. Um, so again, most of my time there was was focused on Earth Dawn, but with a, with a little bit of hey, what about this? Or uh, you know, Tom would say, so I'm doing this Harlequin's back thing. How do we? You know, what do you think about this? And you know, uh, and and again with with both with Tom and Mike, making sure that what we were doing was in sync in terms of not spoiling anything bad or ruining anything or that um, our portrayal of say Harlequin wasn't going to completely invalidate what they did with him because he was clearly a Shadowrun character. He was just a, a character that we would use by name only. We wouldn't have him participate really in any major events on our side. Um, though he did show up in um, in Caroline Spector's novels, um, Scars and Little Treasures. I believe Harlequin is in those. Kimball, as he was known then. Um, and I think he's even in Worlds Without End, but I'm not sure. And that was the Shadowrun novel she wrote. Well, uh, now we're t- kind of tying them both together. Uh, how much from the day one was Earth Dawn meant to be tied into Shadowrun when you guys first started it? So, uh, as I said, I got involved in 92, in the summer of 92, playtesting. Mm-hmm. At that time, I think it was an idea, but it wasn't a confirmed thing. Like, so Earthon started primarily, um, as I understand it, Jordan Weissman, who was, you know, one of the founders and and president, I don't know if he was the president or he might've been president and and Mort, his father was the CEO. I don't recall exactly the titles, Mm -hmm. but no, he wasn't president, Sam was president. But anyway, he was one of the founders, um, had this idea that, that FASA should do a fantasy game and compete with TSR in that genre. Whether or not the idea from the beginning was that it was the past of Shadowrun, I don't know and I can't speak to. Mm-hmm. What I can say is that by the time I had gotten there, by the time I had joined the company and we started talking, the decision had been made that yes, the two were tied together. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember, I think it was my very first day, I went to lunch with Tom Dowd and we started talking about dragons and elves and and magic cycles and how this all works and how, what are the relationships and you know and it was sort of this deep lore thing that was fun to know about but really didn't have any impact or shouldn't have any impact on anybody's game 
really, yeah. right? At the level of, you know, player character adepts in Earthdawn or Shadowrunners in Shadowrun, it shouldn't matter whether or not the immortal elves were, you know, really the children of great, great dragons from 6,000 years ago. That doesn't, shouldn't make a difference into how you pick the lock on the corporate safe, right? Mm. So, um, but it was still fun for us, you know, like, so what are the, you know, who are the dragons and do they have a different name in, in Earthdawn than in Shadowrun and who's who and what about the elves? And so again, it was, it was established and decided, um, by the time I got there, that the two were definitely related. And then the challenge was, how do we portray this relationship without giving it all away? And we never wanted to officially say it. We wanted to hint at it. Um, and some of the hints were obviously stronger than others. And, you know, I think by the time we were relatively subtle, I think. And then, as I recall, it was the Tier 10 Gear source book mm -hmm. where Tom really let it go in the shadow talk sections. Um, where there's more, there's a lot of hints in that one, as well as a couple others later, where it became very clear that the two were definitely tied together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the, the rules were separate enough that, you know, they were separated by thousands of years of time in terms of their setting, um, that the connections were fun, cool, like Easter eggs that we could provide to the players and game masters and, you know, and readers and, and consumers, but it didn't really impact that much, you know, except for, again, Icewing, I couldn't kill Icewing because he still lived in, in the Shadow, future. you know, and I couldn't kill, you know, Dunkelzahn, who was Mountain Shadow, but, you know, so what, I'm not going to, I didn't want to kill them anyway, you know, mm -hmm. um, so, so that's sort of how that, you know, connection came about, and then we would, you know, sort of play with it, and, you know, it's interesting. I was just listening to the Earth on Journal, the Earth on Survival Guide podcast. And uh, I haven't got caught up on that one, but go ahead. <laughs> and in the most recent one that they were talking, it's the second one about dragons. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the assumption has been that the immortal elves were the children of the dragons. And that sort of was the idea, right? Was mm -hmm. that the dragons wanted servants who would look after their interests and elves were already long lived. So maybe if we breed with elves, that'll work out really well. Right. Hmm. Um, and then the dragon, the elves realize, well, we don't need the dragon. So we're on our own. We're cool. You know, we can do what they did. So that sort of led to this immortal dra elf dragon thing. And that was the, the intent and the idea. But it's never been officially said anywhere mm -hmm. in, in a published product. No one has, you know, it's never been confirmed in any sort of can canonical way. And so Josh Harrison, who's the current Earth Online developer, mentioned, you know, we we presume as though that's the case, but what if it wasn't that? What if it was ritual magic that did it? You know, I sort of like the progeny idea just because I think most of the hints and Easter eggs assume that was the case. So they were written with that in mind. So changing it, you know, changing the source now could cause a couple of those to feel a little weird now mm -hmm. in retrospect. Um, and it ties better into the whole outcast Denarastus storyline in, in Earthdawn, where because of the debacle that the immortal elves became, the, the dragons agreed to never sire offspring from name givers again. But the outcast decides he wants to do it anyway, and he does, and he ends up creating this very powerful family of magicians that, you know, with his help, pretty much have world domination in mind. So, um, <clears throat> so I sort of like the the immortal elves or the progeny and you know children of this, but but it's an interesting idea that it, that it's not the case. You know? mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I think I've already wandered a little far afield from your question. Oh no, I, I you, <laughs> that was really interesting. Pretty the, much, uh, I think one of the. Uh, one of the attractions of especially games from Fossa are the depth of detail that they had, and they still do uh, today. Uh, was that something that was planned in the creative process, or was that just something that came out on its own? Was the depth of the uh, the worlds that Fossa created? So um, it's not a coincidence that all the games at Fossa sort of have this active universe thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm speaking for Fossa then, and I think. Games now are still doing the same thing, mm -hmm. but 
um, as you as you know, Battletech was an active universe, right? And so big events would happen usually in the Mike Stackpole novel each year. Mm -hmm. And then the game would sort of fill in the gaps or how does this matter to the player characters? Oh, we introduced the clans, you know, for example, you know, classic example, the clans came. Well, now you can play clans and the different, the different mech technology, all that sort of stuff. So the world is constantly moving. It's activated and it's active. And then Shadowrun sort of became active, you know, with, mm -hmm. with some of the things that they were doing. And so we decided it was time to sort of turn on Earth Dawn and, and, and we did that mostly through Prelude to War, mm -hmm. which, um, and the world was, you know, sort of moving along. And the way, I, the way I've always thought about it is the way we structured the Earth Dawn product line is, um, if you imagine a camera lens looking down at a map of Bar Save, and then it zooms in on particular places. So we start at Bar Save, and then, you know what, we zoom in on Par Lane. Forgotten City, which is the picture oh. behind me, right? And then we zoom back out, and then we zoom in on the Kingdom of Thrall, and then we zoom back out, we zoom down on Sky Point and Vivane, or, um, but that was all to serve the story that we were telling about that world also. Oh. So the timing of that, you know, kind of came. Now, originally, initially, it was sort of like, uh, the goal was, what is this world about? You know, so we want we, we provided the bar save campaign set. We did a couple of adventures, but we really want to provide a very cool place to adventure. Par length was, was pivotal in the original, the first novel, The Longing Ring. So we thought that would be a great setting to kick off. So we did that. And then, you know, the Kingdom of Thrall is important. Uh -huh. uh, though we did Sky Point and Vivane before that, because that was a box set. And by after that, we decided box sets were too expensive. Um, but so we did, you know, the northeast corner and then the southwest corner. And then the Kingdom of Thrall. Now, along the way, we also did what I like to call uh, the What's It Like books, and that includes the Denizens of Earthon books, which, you know, there was two of those, one, each focused on four races that were written in character to explain, you know, each of the races. So there's a chapter on humans and elves and obsidian and dwarfs and orcs and trolls and sky raider, uh, sorry, obsidian and uh, windlings and, and skrang. Um, and then the Adept's Way was the other one, which was written about the disciplines in Earth Dawn to sort of provide an in-world in point of view of what it's like to be an orc and what it's like to be a, a cavalryman or what it's mm -hmm. like you know, to be an obsidian and what it's like to be a wizard or whatever they might be. Um, and so those were books were specifically written that way. And along the way, we developed this conceit that many of these books would be real books from the world of Earth Dawn that are sitting on a shelf at the Library of Thrall. And so, uh, and we wanted to have our own version of Shadow Talk. So in Shadowrun, the books, they had this Shadow Talk stuff where there were electronic documents and people oh, yeah. would post comments. We decided that in our world, these were books on the in the Great Library of Thrall where people just scribbled in the margins. And so oh. we would, we did little sidebars and that's, they, you know, either or when they wrote the books, they left space for people to comment, you know, mm -hmm. you, however you want it to be, but, the intent was we could add little comments that were like marginal notes that people had scribbled. Like, you know, you read this little story about a legend about a place and you could, you know, somebody could, an adventurer, you know, an adept mm -hmm. could look at it and, and write, no, this isn't true at all. Or, oh my God, this is where the monster bit my leg off or, you know, whatever <laughs> it might be. Um, but, but so, you know, we explored the world and then we decided at one of those summits that I talked about, we decided to sort of activate the world and we did it with Prelude to War. And there was this, you know, uneasy tension with the Therans because the Therans had been sort of driven out after the scourge, but before the game setting really was happening, mm -hmm. right? And so we said, well, we've talked about the Therans, why don't we bring them back? And so we, you know, and I had had this idea of, it's interesting, I had this idea, what if the Therans bring one of their behemoths, which is one of their floating castles, like their mm -hmm. skyship castles, and they planted it in Bar Save. And I originally thought, you know, they were near Sky Point and Vivane. I said, what if they cut, you know, land one about a third of the way up into Bar Save, just expanding their radius, like, so they were going to just expand their circle of influence. And we were at the summit and I said, I, what about they do this? And Sean Rhodes, he's the gentleman who wrote the Scrang chapter of Denizens of Earth on volume one. And he wrote the Serpent River book. Mm -hmm. He said, 
no, if we want to do that, we should plunk it down here. And he put it right in the middle of the Serpent River where it ended up being in Prelude to War, mm -hmm. um, which was the intersection of this thing. And it was, and then we decided it would be sitting on top of a life rock which would, you know, angered the obsidian, so that mm. was cool. And then, and so from that, we we decided there would be that. And then what if the king of Thrall was assassinated, but he's assassinated, it, it's, you know, the Therans are framed for it, but it's really the Denerastus, these bad guy magicians up in the Northwest corner, um, who at that time, we had not decided they were children of a dragon. We just knew they were bad guy magicians. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to sort of get to part of one of your questions, um, not everything was fleshed out from the beginning, all the details. You know, mm -hmm. we we sort of operated, uh, a term we used internally was to vagify things. Was, mm -hmm. and the guideline that I use, used, and I still use, and I, you know, when my, I talk with my son about writing stories and, you know, and, and things, um, is, and, and this isn't particularly unique or insightful maybe, but is, you want to provide as much detail as you have to, but as little as necessary, as little as possible, but as much as necessary. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't, and this is something I sort of got from Tom Dowd, you don't want to flesh out every single detail of every single corner of bar save in the first year of the game's life, because a cool story potential idea might come up later that you've written, your, you know, you've basically precluded yourself from doing it if you've provided too much detail. So we wanted to provide enough detail and enough information to be useful and to make the story work, but not so much that it boxed in any future development. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, we knew the, the Denerastus are the bad guys behind this, but only later did we kind of decide that they would actually be the children of a dragon and that's why they're cool. Um, <laughs> and then we also thought it might be cool if the or if the orc nation of Karafad was reborn. So we added that event. And then I think the last was the theft of the ever loving flower. Um, which was an artifact that was introduced in the very first adventure in the game, Mists of Betrayal, just as a MacGuffin. It was just the thing that the characters were supposed to bring to the Bloodwood, mm -hmm. right? And in the adventure, they bring it to the Bloodwood, they have some tension there, and on the way back, they get into the whole guts of the adventure with the mist. So the Everliving Flower is just the thing that causes them to get into the trouble that they end up getting into. But we decided that it was an important elven artifact, and what if... It was also important to the dragons or what if they stole it? And so that became another event. So we came up with these four events to try to start to activate the world. So things were starting to happen. So other various factions would start to respond in kind. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so once we did that, then we had to sort of deal with the consequences of that. And, and then um, the plan was to lead to war. A big, uh, the product was gonna be called Bar Save at War. But before we got there, we wanted to actually describe and and talk about all the factions and players in the war. So we had, you know, we had done the Kingdom of Thrall, we had done the Serpent River, we we wanted to do the Orc Nation of Karafad, we did the Crystal Raiders of Barsave, we had done the Theron Empire, we and then even the Secret Societies of Barsave book was there because some secret societies were going to play a part in the war. So we and then the last book was going to be the dragons. And so we were going to have a book about all the major players and then Bar Save at War would sort of show the game master how to sort of play this war out. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when the game sort of didn't happen. Well, that's when the game was discontinued. Um, and honestly, I think Bar Save at War was gonna be challenging, more challenging than I thought at the time. Um, Prelude to War was such that we could describe these events that happened off screen, if you will, like mm -hmm. well beyond the control of the player characters. The King of Thrall is assassinated and you get wrapped up in the consequences in the aftermath. The Therans land this behemoth and you get wrapped up in the aftermath. Um, the orcs reform their nation and you get wrapped up in the aftermath. And that's cool. But we wanted the player characters to play a pivotal part in the war, but then the only way to do that is to basically um, guide them into specific circumstances. It was just, it was going to be challenging to pull off mm -hmm. in a way that wasn't very um, railroady. Railroady, right? That's what I couldn't remember the word, but that's basically, I mean, and sometimes railroady is fine, I think, honestly, right? But, but it was going to be more railroady than prelude to war. So in the end, as much as I was disappointed that we didn't get to do it, 
I think in some ways, the way that living uh, that FASA Games has ultimately resolved that situation is probably the best, which is they just wrote up a new history about what happened in the war and how it went by. And now the game line timeline is advanced. Um, you know, so after FASA stopped the game a year or two later, um, a company called Living Room Games got the license and they were determined to finish. They wanted to publish Bar Save at War. Um, and I think their version of it um, wasn't what I would have done. And I don't mm. think it was, I don't think it was bad, but it wasn't that good. <laughs> Could you tell us what you would have done and what, what, your, what your plan was? Well, so the, the intent was that there was going to be a, a series of battles or scenarios in which the war was fought. And so there would be a battle at Triumph, which was the, was the behemoth that had landed, mm -hmm. where they would, you know, a, a group of the collected forces would drive the Therans out of there, or try to at least. Um, and then there would be a concentrated war effort down on at, at Sky Point and Vivane. And the intent was that uh, Sky Point would be the main point where everybody, all the forces of Barsay, the Orc Scorchers on the ground, the, Ther the Troll Sky Raiders in the sky, um, the Throlic army, uh, the dragons, that would be the main, the big battle. But then there remained this challenge of, well, what about Vivane? It's the city with thousands of troops. I mean, unless they send them all to Sky Point, the Therans are still going to have a presence. And, and so that's where we had this idea that the dragons would say, don't worry, we'll take care of Vivane for you. And their solution was <clears throat> in the either Sky Point, I think in the Sky Point Vivane set, um, there was a, a reference to a place called Stormhead with this horror cloud that was just this giant cloud of horror and horror magic, horrors and horror magic. Mm -hmm. And their intent was they would use ritual magic, which in the Dragon's Book, we went out of our way to say, dragons don't use ritual magic anymore because it's very, very dangerous and they've caused problems in the past using it. Mm -hmm. but this is important enough that they'll use ritual magic and they'll move this horror cloud over Vivane to deal with it. Oh, wow. Which just seems pretty extreme. And one of the interesting things that, one of the interesting differences or changes that the Living Room Games guys changed, made in, in their version of it, is they didn't think the dragons would do that. They didn't think, they thought that was too far. The dragon, it was a step too far. Even the dragons wouldn't be that bad. And I tried to say, no, they are very, they're not good. They're maybe on your side, but I, I kind of likened it to working with the mob where, you know, they may get you the result you want, but you will not like the way they do it, you know? And so to the, to the dragons, the Theron population in Vivane is not consequential and they're Therans anyway, and Therans are bad, so it's cool. They thought that was an outrageous thing that the, no, even the dragons wouldn't do that. And so their solution was the dragons would use ritual magic to create a big air, a dome of elemental air around Vivane to isolate them from the war instead. And that, but the challenge was it was so powerful that the, it, it attracted the horror cloud and the horror cloud ended up over Vivane anyway. Hmm. So my challenges with that were, so you're saying the dragons don't realize the mistake they're making. A, I think they would do it. And hmm. I was the one who was in, you know, I was the one who had dictated all the things they had done up to then. So for yeah. anyone else to tell me that they wouldn't do that seemed odd, but whatever. <laughs> no, that's cool. They own the game then. So that's cool. Right. Um, again, I do think they wouldn't balk at doing something that, that nasty. Um, and then, but then, so with this whole air dome thing, so it means the dragons have made a mistake. A, but B, if they hadn't made a mistake, was the air dome permanent or was it temporary? And when it ran out, aren't there still thousands of Theron troops there? So doesn't that not really solve the problem? You know, like, so I didn't think it was, I, that particular part of it, I just, I had a big challenge with and I told them so and they, but they did their own thing and which is cool that they, you know, it was their game to do. Yeah. Um, but that was, you know, sort of the biggest, uh, so that, and the end result would have been the Therans were driven out of Bar Save. Uh, Vivane would have been a smoking husk of itself and horror tainted. And one of the ideas we had was it was going to be a city of the undead. Um, and, you know, people say, but don't we already have that in Parlanth? Parlanth is different. Parlanth was, 
several different regions of different bad horror magic stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas one of the idea, one of the things I wanted to sort of visit in Earth Dawn was, um, so we know that blood magic is very powerful in Earth Dawn. In a game like that, what are vampires like, right? I mean, that oh. is an intriguing question to me. So I thought this would give us an opportunity to do a book about Vivane, the city of the dead, and really focus on what are undead like in Earth Dawn? What are the different types of undead? How do they work? Are there rules? You know, like we had a, we had introduced a bunch of different types of undead as along the way. There were cadaver men, there were whites. There was a, an errant reference to vampires at one point that I wish I had not included, but I did. Um, and so there were undead-like things. And there was, you know, nethermancy is a whole big thing, but we had never sort of stepped back and said, well, what does undead really work? How does it work in Earth Dawn? And what is it all about? And that was going to be our way to do that. Um, and then and then other implications with with, um, with King Naden, the, you know, the King Varulus the third is killed in Prelude to War. Naden takes over, but one of the ideas was that Naden is actually killed in one of the battles of the war. And so Thrall goes into chaos. Um, and then we had this idea that perhaps there would be a schism and half of them would leave and try to resettle a different dwarven kingdom. And so we, we had a handful of ideas of what we were gonna do um, in 1999 back then, but but the game was discontinued, discontinued in 1998. So we never got to, we never got to really explore that. But now um, FASA Games and Josh are really kind of taking that forward and they've started, um, they've sort of reactivated the world with this event that in a book there, that's called Empty Thrones, mm -hmm. where, um, so the Denarastas are the guys that killed the king and they're sort of this major new threat, um, but their leader, Ul Denarastas is killed. And so there's chaos that, that spews out of that. And we'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens, so. Uh, take it you can't go into more detail on that i don't know <laughs> oh okay I, well, I figure you might have a foot, your foot in the door on that one no no i don't really know much more than that so uh what was your of all the games you have worked on what has been your favorite to work the most enjoyable to work on and why well so i think there's a couple of parts to that question i think in terms of games overall i think Earthon has to be it because i got to you know develop this world and i'm still very humbled and honored and flattered whenever I talk, when I hear people talking about how much they love the game, the fact that it survived into fourth edition and that there's a, you know, thriving online community about it um, is very rewarding. You know, I, I didn't do the initial, you know, design, you know, Greg Gordon designed the game rules and system and some of the setting and Chris, Christopher Kubasik did most of the initial setting design, mm. but I helped flush it out. I shepherded it through the products and I, you know, sort of had the vision for where it was going to go and it's it's very satisfying and and um to, to still hear you know that the fact that you wanted to talk to me about it 20 plus years later is still you know very gratifying um and so I'm that's just, uh, i'm amazed great you, you actually agreed to talk to me <laughs> uh, absolutely you know sure I, 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 people will tell you i love to hear my own voice um and i love to talk about earth Dawn too so um but of all the books that we did, you know, so in terms of the game or game system, I think Earthbound has to be it. Um, I certainly had a lot of fun with DC Heroes because it was my first and I love comic books and, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, Earthbound was a completely different thing because I got to, you know, sort of develop this world and help flush it out and, and you know, call, you know, and gather creative people to help me do that, you know, like, like the picture behind me is Parlength, the Forgotten City. Mm -hmm. you know, Christopher Gubasa came up with the idea for Parlength and he talked about it. But then we, you know, we worked with Robin Laws who helped flesh it out and turn it into the very cool setting that it is now. Um, you know, um, Sean Rhodes, who was a, a, you know, a friend of mine, ended up flushing out and developing the Scrang, the Tuscrang culture in the Serpent River, which everybody thinks, you know, most Earthdawn fans think it's very, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so getting to write, you know, work with these people to help us flesh out this world and and develop it. And, you know, and Steve Kenson was a person that, you know, he works with um, Green Ronin Games now, but he was an early contributor uh, to the to the Shadowrun and FASA and Earthdawn lines. Um, so that was a, a lot of fun, you know, to have these ideas and say, 
so we want to develop this thing. Why don't you, you know, tell, you know, come tell us what you want to do with it and then to work with them to, to develop it. Mm -hmm. um, within Earth Dawn itself, I think the products that I'm proudest of are probably Prelude to War, um, which again is this event-based thing. And at the mm -hmm. time, again, I had been pretty involved in the game industry. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting in our sort of pre-recording, pre-session chat, we talked, I talked about some of the games I'd worked on and you had mentioned that you weren't familiar with all of those, which is, yeah. which is fine and cool, right? Um, and I think sometimes those of us in, you know, in the industry, and I'm not anymore, but who stay on top, whose job it is to stay on top and stay involved and understand what's going on. I think we forget that not everybody who plays our games is as, as widely read as we are, yeah. you know, like, um, and so I had read lots of stuff. I, you know, I, I still following the Forgotten Realms. And, and once I was in the industry, I managed to work out, you know, a number of like at conventions, we would trade products. Like I would say, here's my new Earthon product. What's your new cool thing? And so my collection got very big and I, I didn't in depth read every single word of every book, but I definitely got the gist. And, and at the time, I don't know that another book like Prelude to War had ever been done before. Um, in the same way with these, you know, massive events that sort of triggered this other stuff. Um, so I was very proud of that one. And then the other one that I think was very cool, um, that was fun to work on was Blades, which is a short adventure, an adventure collection of six, six short adventures around a magical item called the Blades of Karafad. Um, and so what that's about is in Earth Dawn, I think you know this, but in Earth Dawn magic items, it's not like in D&D, or many games where if you find a magic, you know, sword, long sword plus two, you just pick it up and all of a sudden you're plus two to what your attacks. In Earth Dawn, you have to study the history of the item. You have to connect it to your own magical pattern using thread weaving. Mm -hmm. You have to know its history. And as you learn more about its history, you can get more and more power out of it. That was something we introduced right away. And it was challenging to describe. And it was, you know, again, something that was, I think, brand new. I don't know that anybody had ever done really anything like that before. But even early on, Greg Gordon and I said, talked to each other and said, we should probably sometime try to do a product that shows how this works. And so that was the impetus for, for Blades. And rather than make it, you know, um, the sword, the cool sword, where one character in the group is motivated to do it, but not everybody is, we instead made it a group of a set of daggers so there was one for everybody in the group as long as your group was no more than seven which mm -hmm. is a safe bet right so even the wizard might get benefits from this this magic set of daggers so we wanted a group item that all the characters would be motivated to find because it was a, it was a, a, a magic item used by the group they could all weave their own threads and it was it's kind of a different thing but it really illustrated how magic items work in the game um and how and was a model for how game masters could you know build a whole little campaign around a magic item for their groups um so that was another cool those were two particularly interesting products to work on uh what person pushed you the most and uh really sparked your creativity uh in game developing um i, I would have to say greg gordon um it's interesting because I sort of followed him around, if you will, right? Like he started, you know, he did DC Heroes and I was into DC Heroes, not because of him, because of the comics, but that sort of started our relationship. And then he he went and did Torg and I worked on Torg and I worked with him like on the spell design system that was in the Isle book and we did playtesting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, um, then he went to do Earth Dawn and I became the developer. And so it was interesting, you know, I sort of worked for him and then I became kind of his boss at the very end because I was the line developer when he was submitting the final version of the game. And so he, you know, he's like, I have this idea. What do you think I want to do? It's your decision now, which was a freaky thing to hear from him, right? For me, like, wait a minute, I'm telling <laughs> you what to do now. That was a weird thing. Um, but just working with him, um, getting to know him and understand sort of understanding how he did what he did sort of helped me um, understand how games work. You know, um, I remember distinctly rereading the designer notes that were included in the 
Mayfair DC Heroes, you know, I probably read those a hundred times just to try to get insights into how and why certain things worked the way they did. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of gives you this, you know, gets you this analytic point of view. So when you get another game, you can see, oh, this is why, why it works that way. Um, what's interesting is just the other day on Facebook, I saw somebody pointing out, it was, um, for, it's the 40th anniversary of Champions this year, and they had a big party. And I think it was John Wick, game designer, who wrote Champions, showed him how to design games because it, it didn't hide any of its secrets. It was very open and a transparent system. You, the mechanics sort of showed you how it all worked together. Mm -hmm. So just by understanding how to play the game and how to build a character, you understood how it all went together. Whereas some games sort of obscure that in charts and tables and secret math, you know, that mm -hmm. might be behind the scenes. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of my game design side of things, it was definitely Greg that sort of um, prompted me and, and helped me uh, develop my creativity on that side. Okay. Um, I know Earthdyne worked hand in hand with a lot of the artists to help create the feel of the universe. How much collaboration did you guys have together with the game developers and the artists? Uh, well, they were across the hall, so a fair amount. Um, but we, you know, I never tried to say you shouldn't do this. I mean, there were a couple points where I said, no, I don't think it should look like this. I don't think they should do this. You know, I don't think this this looks silly to me or whatever. You know, but for the most part, um, as long as it didn't violate the world that we had built. We tried to give the artists as much leeway as they can because they want to be creative too. And and by doing that, they introduce new ideas that we can then play with, you know. So it was a very sort of back and forth collaborative uh, effort, you know. And when the artwork would come in, they would ask me what I think and if I like it and stuff. But again, I I would only you know raise an issue if I thought it was very blatantly wrong, like. Uh -huh. um, you know, if the anatomy was completely wacky, like this dwarf shouldn't have long, long, pointy, pointy ears, like else, <laughs> you know, something outrageous like that. Or yeah. no, there are no, you know, just female to scrang don't have breasts, you know, something basic like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was collaborative, you? but it wasn't, you know, I didn't, I would, I would never, you know, try to tell them what to do. Though we did also have to, you know, sometimes write art notes for the, you know, we'd have to put notes together to tell the art director what what kind of stuff to look for. Um, but we, you know, we were lucky in that, you know, during the first few years of Earth on Jeff Lobenstein was the art director at FASA. Mm -hmm. So he worked on it early and then Jim Nelson took over and they were both, they're both, you know, fantastic artists. I know Joel mentioned both of them in his interview with you. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, you know, we were lucky in that we had, you know, and we would play the game from time to time and, you know, they would, you know, they were fans of the games as well. So um, it was a very collaborative environment. Yeah, I was, uh, you, you talked about how your work interacted with them. I was wondering, uh, I was also wondering how much their artwork inter uh, influenced your uh, de game developing. Um, sure. So mostly in the details. So mm -hmm. for instance, when I got there, I was handed a, you know, I don't remember it was Greg sent it to me before when I got it when I first got to FASA, but I got a big pile of artwork of different creatures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they had just said, guys, go nuts, draw some cool stuff. And so we took certain weapons, like there's a weapon in Earth uh, called the Hawk Hatchet, which is like mm -hmm. this boomerang like thing that um, was designed and originally illustrated by Mike Nielsen. Um, that he had just done as a concept sketch. You know, this is what weapons might look like. So we said, oh, that's kind of cool. So we statted it up and it became a thing in the game. Or here's a concept sketch for this weird little creature. So we made that, you know, so there was a lot of influence at the, at the sort of the detail level mm -hmm. where they would add details. And we're like, ooh, that's cool. Let's figure out what that is. Um, and then, you know, we would also solicit feedback from them to say, you know, what do you think we should do with the game? You know, what are some cool ideas that you have? How would you like to do this or that or whatever? Um, so we, we definitely tried to um, make it go back and forth, you know, to have the artwork influence the game as much as, you know, the artwork be dictated by the words, you know. So, uh, 
FASA has always, we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, FASA has always been good at moving along meta plots in a living timeline, not doing big jumps. Was that something that was on the games that you guys developed, something that was uh, from the start, we're going to do a living timeline or just something that kind of developed? I kind of asked a little bit about this earlier. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like what we talked about before with this activated universe thing, right? So by the time I joined FASA, Battletech had already become a very active universe again, where there would be an annual novel by Mike Stackpole mm -hmm. that would sort of kick off events of, of a various you know, um, of various types. Shadowrun moved a little slower. Uh, it didn't have quite as much active stuff, but it was more going on in the background. Mm -hmm. And that fits that world better, you know, and that, um, you know, sort of dictated where some of the products ended up. And then uh, again, with Earthdawn, we started the first few years to just sort of establish this world and provide some cool stuff to do. And then we decided to, to activate it, but it was definitely sort of a corporate, it was a corporate kind of philosophy. Like, we produce games that you know with with active universes where the store there's a storyline that's moving forward um but the trick there is to not overdo it to not overly influence the character the, the game masters in their games mm -hmm. and i think i think we did a good job with that with earthdawn because even if you were playing earthdawn and you got into the prelude to war stuff you could participate in it as much or as little as you wanted now it might change some things that you were using, but but that's the nature of of you know. I think most games change at some point or another. You know, mm -hmm. most game settings, fleshed out game settings, have meta plot of one set or another. The trick is to, and in my opinion, at least, the trick is to engineer those events so that the player characters and the game masters can have their games interact and participate in them without it dictating to them how to, how to run their game. Um, and it, I think it makes the world more interesting. You know, one, one issue I heard that people had with my ideas for Bar Save a War was, we have the Sky, Bait, Sky Point and Vivane box set, it's really cool, you're gonna completely invalidate that whole product. My counter to that was yes, that but that product is five or six years old and it didn't sell especially well in the grand scheme of things. It was not one of the top sellers. So maybe doing something different is an okay thing to do, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, and one of the things that we need to keep in mind is it's a business and we need to try to think of things that we're, are going to sell. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a business reason for the products as well as a story reason for the products. You know, and so um, when we decided to do Bar Prelude to War, I don't recall exactly if she used these words, but by then Jill Lucas was the president. She said, so this means there's going to be a war, right? I'm like, yes, Jill, there'll be a war sometime. We'll get to it, I promise. You know, so um, you have to sort of think about the bigger picture in terms of how these products fit together and why you're going to do the, a particular product at a particular time. And uh and how it plays into the larger storyline and you know like for instance we had kind of concluded that there wasn't that much interest in the therans in bar save it just didn't seem the the theron empire book and and i know i recall one of the questions you have is about that book and we talk about that a little bit um the theron empire book and the sky point by rain set weren't you know lighting the sales channels on fire so one of the reasons we decided that in prelude to war we would push the therans out was it didn't seem to be a big interest. So let's set them aside, let them stew. And then eventually they'll come back and they'll come back angry and we can do something cool with them. Um, but it, you know, you have to think about all these different factors when you, when you sort of plan this stuff out, you can't always just do what sounds fun and cool. You have to be able to justify it. Like, why are we doing this product now? Because we want to activate the world. Well, why are we doing this product now? Because the next product, we need to understand who the orcs are before they can help fight the war. Okay, that makes sense. We need to understand who the trolls are. We need to know who the dragons are. You know, so um, we were telling the story over time, uh, but it all had to sort of fit together and and make you know and and be part of the bigger picture. I think that's something a lot of games have have uh, failed to do and just uh, push their storyline, uh, which should have taken a, lo a lot longer. Just we're doing it overnight, and you're, everybody said, "Well, how did we get here?" 
Right. Yeah. Like White Wolf did that. 40K is doing it now. Uh, many games have done that over the years. And I think FASA has been, uh, in their products, has been very good at doing a slow living timeline and easing it in. Like like you said, why yeah. did we get here? Yeah. Not, we're, not we're here now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's certainly true during the time I was there and shortly after. I mean, I haven't kept up as t- as closely as I could, particularly with Shadowrun and its and its various incarnations since since FASA folded. But but overall, I think it's true. And I, my suspicion is that Battletech has continued very much in the way it always has been because Randall loves Battletech with a way in a way that few people love things mm-hmm. like you know it's pretty deep in him. So and I'm gonna. You mind if I start on the fan questions then? Sure. I mean, we're at an hour 20 now. So, I don't oh, know. wow. Oh, I, I didn't. Time <laughs> just flew by there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm good to go a little longer, but. Okay. Um, yeah. Just uh, if we get going too long, I'll try to cut these a little shorter then. Uh, what is your favorite piece of Earth Dawn art by Joel Bisk? Or Joel Bisk asks, what is <laughs> your favorite Earth Dawn art? Right. And I suspect he asked me this because I asked him that same question. <laughs> um, and I didn't listen enough to get the answer to it, but. Um, my favorite, so it's a complicated question, but my favorite is um, probably the one behind me, Powerland, the Forgotten City. Mm-hmm. If I had to pick a single picture, I think it's the most evocative of the setting, and I think it brings the setting to life. You know, it speaks to what Earth Dawn is about in a very powerful way. Um, however, there's a couple others, and one is a pretty obscure one. Um, so when we launched Earth Dawn, we did the series of promotional flyers where we basically uh, the first flyer introduced two characters and their story. The second introduced two more characters. And the third produce provided a simplified version of the rules and an adventure that a game master could play before the game was published. Mm-hmm. And one of the characters in that was a character, an elven sword master called Migana. And she was based on a character my wife had played in our playtest games. Um, and Tony Sudlow, one of the staff artists at FASA, did a piece a picture, a portrait of her face. And it's one of my favorite pieces, just because I wrote the whole scenario for this thing. And Mikano is based on my wife's character. And it was just a beautiful piece of art. I mean, it's pretty obscure, um, but it's very cool. Um, I also love Power Length. Tony also did a piece of a, an orc, an orc scorcher riding a thunder beast that I had on the wall of my office for many years. I couldn't find a picture of it online, but it was a great piece. Um, well, if you can send me the uh, the pieces of art that you uh, were talking about now, I'll splice them into the uh, video uh, when, after we're done. Okay. Yeah, I found I found a copy of the portrait of Migana. Um, one of the products we released, one of the things we did with Earthbound to help promote it was a CD-ROM of the rules. So it was an electronic version of the core rules, and we included the flyers on it, and we, we distributed it with Shadis Magazine, and I think we made thousands of copies of this thing um and i have a copy of it on my i have it on my google drive actually so i can get to it from multiple computers um just because every so often a game rule thing will i mm-hmm. just you know I'll, I'll look it up and it has some of the artwork there and it had some of the products and stuff and another another piece i really like um also by tony sudlow was the cover of a product called infected mm-hmm. it was pretty cool too so, but overall, if I had to pick one, it's the Parlant cover for sure. Okay. Uh, Nick Lowe asked, there was some controversy in the Theron Empire, specifically the regions of the uh, Theron mm-hmm. province that took from real world cultures and mythologies. Uh, in more obvious ways, how did the, uh, the FASA team feel about that at the time? Well, so that was, I, I recall that. And um, from the beginning, the concept the, the conceit for the Theron Empire was that it it and its various sort of provinces or regions or territories were the precursors of the ancient civilizations that we know today. Mm-hmm. And so that's why even in this painting behind me, you can see architecture that's reminiscent. Now there's a little Mesoamerican stuff, but you can see architecture that's reminiscent of Roman and Greek architecture and right. And so the intent all along was that the Theron Empire, the, the regions again and, and the parts that comprise the Theron Empire were the precursors for the modern, what we think of today as the ancient civilizations. Mm-hmm. And so it was always going to be the case that the 
the parts of the Theran Empire would be based on, you know, would be the inspiration or reminiscent of ancient Rome or ancient Egypt or ancient India or all these other cultures from that part of the world. Now, you know, Earthdawn is actually set in Eastern Europe, basically, mm -hmm. um, right? The Death Sea, which is at the bottom, is really the Black Sea. Oh. Um, if you, on the far southwest corner, what we call the Celestrian Sea, that's the Mediterranean. And so the island of Thera is really the island of, you know, it's equivalent to Atlantis, which is, you know, Thera is a real place. I think it's, you know, um, and so that sort of dictated some of that. Um, and we had set the ground rule. What's interesting about that controversy, if you will, is mm -hmm. we had set sort of the expectation for that, even in the Skypoint and by Vane box set, because that book product introduces some of these regions. Um, and what we did in, in the Theron Empire was Robin Laws took those and elaborated on them. But I think in the, in the process, some of the connections became more obvious, perhaps, and blatant. But again, part of the instructions for that was the Theron Empire and its constituent regions are the precursors for these ancient civilizations. So I wouldn't have wanted him to create a completely different culture and region for what is now considered what we think of as ancient Egypt. I wanted it to be recognizable as ancient Egypt, just with a slightly different name. So it was definitely by design. Um, it was, you know, by, for some people it was an unpopular choice perhaps, but it was definitely by design. It was always the intent. And it's, it's not like something that we came up, you know, what, oh my God, what if we do this? Like that was the plan all along that that's where it came from. And the Theron empire, the Theron architecture was one of the, you know, sort of bits of art direction was it should be a mishmash of ancient civilization, you know, of architecture from ancient civilization. So like this picture, we should see Roman and Greek and, you know, Egyptian and a bunch of different architectures all sort of mashed together because that's what the Theron Empire sort of is. So I think that answers your question. Ah, uh, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Very well. Or not your uh, question, but the question from whoever. You know, uh, I'm going to slaughter this name. Sven Tor Museth. I've slaughtered that. I apologize. Well, Sven. Uh, <laughs> Sven, yeah. Uh, how do you envision that Barse after the Theron uh, would, uh, after the war with the Theron Empire and all that? Um, so we talked about this a little bit late earlier. Um, the way I saw Barsave looking after what would have been our version of Barsave at war was um, the, the Therans are driven out. Vivane is a like smoking husk of its former self. It's now a city of undead. Vi uh, Sky Point is mostly a big mountain of rubble. Um, Thrall is in the midst of a bit of a civil war because they can't decide who should be their king because Naden is dead. Um, this, this, most of the races, you know, the orcs and the trolls and the Tuscrang, they are all largely the way they were. Um, the dragons are much, pretty much the way they were, though one or two of them, I think one died, and so that can cause some ripples of stuff. Um, and then sitting in the northwest corner are the Denerastus, who have helped cause some of this chaos and are planning on reaping, the, reaping their rewards eventually by, you know, weakening basically all their other opponents, all the people that might stand in their way, and then they will start to, you know, make their way, pursue their plans to sort of eventually take over and dominate a little bit more of Barsave. They're, they were going to be the next big bad guys, and one of the products we had planned for 1999 was um, a product called Pawns of the Dragon, which was going to uh, explore Iopos, the city, but also the Denarastus family, as well as their allied forces. So there's uh, one of the houses of the Tuscrang, not Katenshin, House Ishkrat, I believe, the one in the far Northwest, would be aligned with the house dinner with the dinner astus there's um a windling clan up there um they may have some other you know they were going to claim the city of jerus basically take that over so um there would be somewhat you was going to be somewhat chaotic and uh 
And, and they didn't do it all, but they did enough of it. They contributed enough of the events to, you know, sort of be the bad guys behind the scenes. So they were definitely going to be the main bad guy for a period of time until the Therans came back. And, you know, how that would happen is a mystery. And then another far off thought that I had was that in the Theron Empire source book, in the chapter about Fekara, which is the continent of Africa, there's this talk of this spider totem. Um, which is a big, bad, I don't know if it's a horror or if it's a spirit or what it was, but I thought that would be interesting for a, um, for a threat big enough that all these squabbling parties would have to unite again. Mm. You know, um, that would have been several years off, but it was one of these ideas I sort of had in my head. And then, you know, I thought eventually we might get across the, what is the Atlantic Ocean to visit what is North America and South America, what we know as those areas, what are those like in the time of Earth Dawn? Um, but again, those were very, very sketchy ideas that we didn't get very far to explore into. Uh, Joel uh, D. Pippa asks, what would you have liked to add to Earth on that you never were able to, like, setting-wise? So, so uh, one thought I had was, so one idea that we had talked about for Bar Save at War, which was in my outline. So if you go online and on look, you can find an, a document that I released years ago called, it was basically my outline for Bar Save at War um, that illustrates what I had in mind and all this other stuff. Um, if you send me a link to it, I'll put it in the description. I'm not sure where, it, I mean, I have the original, so I don't go look for it, but I, I could see if I can find it online um, or somebody could listen to it and post it when you-, when no, you I, I'll, it I'll ask to the Earth Down group, somebody will probably be able to send it. Somebody, to someone will have it. Um, um, and so, now I lost my train of thought. Sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. So no, um, one of the ideas we had in this that was in my document was that the, er, the airship, the Earthon would return during the big battle. So one of the idea, one of the things in Earthon is that when they, when the Kingdom of Thrall was first opening up their doors, they sent out some airships and one of them was mm. the Earthon, captained by Var Longfang, I think was her name and it disappears. We never heard from it again. Mm -hmm. One of the ideas was what if the Earth Dawn comes back and helps save the day? And we decided that that was a little bit too much deus ex machina. We weren't gonna do that, but I didn't take it out of my document and the living room game guys actually included it. Oh. Interesting side bit. But one of the ideas of that was that, so a couple of the products we had done along the way were the uh, Legends of Earth Dawn, Right, so Earthon is the age of legend. It's about legendary stories and legends, and so these books were basically legends that could be the basis of an adventure for a game master. So the game master could just read one of these and use it as the seed for an adventure. And we had two two of them. One product that I thought would be fun would be the Journal of the Earthon Legends Volume Three, which would be excerpts from the diaries and journals of the crew of the Earthon after it returns. But by then, they've circumnavigated the globe. And so we could read about legends from Cathay, from Picara, from, you know, Earth Dawn era, North and South America. And, oh. and, and maybe even maybe even have crew members from those areas. So the idea is that the ship got lost, couldn't get back to Barsay, but it went off and had adventures and has circumnavigated the globe and been to almost all of the various um, civilized areas of the globe. So there may be a Cathayan person or there might be um somebody from you know australia the australia continent or south america, yeah. south america or whatever and so that was something i thought would be kind of fun and what i wanted to do was see if we could create a, a way for characters to be defined in those other areas that use the same core basic mechanics as in step numbers and ranks and that stuff, but didn't necessarily follow the disciplines as we know them. My thought was that the disciplines that we see in the Earth Dawn game are the way they're practiced in Bar Save and the Theron Empire. Mm -hmm. They're not the way it works in the world of the way it's done in Bar Save. So one of my philosophies is that the, the world should dictate the rules in game. So as the world develops, we adjust the rules to sort of fit that, not the other way around. So um, for instance, 
does it make sense that the culture in Cathay, which is basically China, mm -hmm. um, would use the same discipline approach that is used in Barsave in, in Eastern Europe? Like, why would they practice magic in the same way? Now, obviously, at a fundamental game mechanic balance, you have to figure out a way that makes them roughly equivalent, right? And they have to use steps mm -hmm. and dice and all that. But what if, what if character types worked differently there? What if they had a talent progression that worked differently? What if they had different types of talents? Um, and so I wanted, one thing I, one of the more crazy ideas I had was for different regions of the world for, for adepts to work in a very, in a fundamentally different way than the way they work in bar safe. Because I felt those disciplines represent how uh, characters, how people in the world manifest and use magic in that region, not necessarily the way it is in the world and the game. Um, so when, when um, I guess it was Red Brick did their cafe source book, I was kind of disappointed that it was just disciplines like they are in Barsave. I thought this is an opportunity to do something new and different and cool, and then they, they lost it. One particularly wacky idea I had was uh, came from watching Pocahontas of all places. Of all things. <laughs> so the 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 you know the Disney animated film Pocahontas mm -hmm. towards the end when Pocahontas realizes there's about to be this big battle and John Smith might get killed and all this, she runs to save him and she calls out. She goes, you know, mountain make my heart beat strong and eagle help me run or whatever. She calls to the spirits of the world to help her get there quickly. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the player character's abilities were based on basically gifts from the spirits that their talent, their abilities were ways to tap into the spirit power and boost their natural abilities. In a mechanical level, they would work a lot like talents, but their source would be different. And the way the characters would advance would be different. They would have to develop an affinity for different types of spirits. Like not everybody can tap every spirit, like you different paths lead, you know, you might focus on animal spirits, you might focus on earth and nature spirits or whatever they might be. It, it sounds like it would tie in very well with the uh, Shadowrun shamans. Right. Well, as I after I had this idea, I kind of thought, oh, I wish Shadowrun Shamans had done it that way instead. That would have been kind of <laughs> cool. But, but so that again, this was a bit of a wacky, pretty far out idea. And I'm not sure how it would have worked really mechanically, but it was a way to say this, you know, basically um, prehistorical Native American adept, mm -hmm. this is how he does magic, his magic things. He doesn't, he's not a warrior adept like you are with gliding stride and all that stuff. Yeah. But man, when he calls on the spirit of the mountain to help him, watch out, you know? So yeah. it was just a way, a different, a different sort of model for where the magical abilities came from that I thought would be kind of fun to play with. And again, I, one thing I kind of wish we had been able to do was to really um, highlight this idea that magic works perhaps in different ways like char magical characters manifest their powers and they develop their powers in different ways in different regions of the earth. Just like you have different cultures and different, uh, different approaches right. to different right. things. Right. Um, so that was one thing that would have been kind of cool, you know, like this journal of the earth on was something that I thought would be really fun. And I even thought that the earth on itself would be looking pretty different. It would have been had to be rebuilt a few times. Maybe it's actually got a trapped air spirit in it. That's how it flies. And, you know, I just had just sort of let the ideas spin one day, you know, like what would be, you know, cool. Now, how it all works, I don't know yet. But um, so that's the piece I sort of wish we'd had gotten the chance to do, which is to sort of expand the world a little bit. But oh, gonna... I, I got two more questions for you because we're okay. running out of time. I had to cut the list down a lot. Uh, this is another one from uh, Spin. I, I don't know enough about Earth Down to understand the question totally, but uh, I said, uh, could they involve other Loco, lo, Loco, 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 yeah, okay, uh, giving uh, clues to the cataclysm to come? So, so what that ties into is in Earth on one of the sort of fundamental ideas is that so Earth on and Shadowrun exist in this world where there's a cycle of magic where magic mm -hmm. grows and ebbs over time, like in a sine wave, right? Mm -hmm. And Shadowrun is at the very beginning of its up cycle. Earth Dawn is just after the peak of its upcycle. And the peak of the upcycle is the scourge where the horrors come because magic is so prevalent. The horrors just walk in and chew up everything. 
Um, and one of the sort of fundamental ideas of Earthon is that the magic level stopped falling like they thought it would. Mm -hmm. And it stopped at a point where basically the Therans enacted mass massive ritual magic at the end of the scourge to freeze the magic level of the earth at a point where it was powerful enough to ensure they had strong magical power, but not powerful enough for too hard. Like they, they, they let it go low enough so most of the really bad horrors had to go, but it was still strong enough so they still retained their, their power. And they did this through a massive ritual in what they did basically behind the scenes. And this is very deep spoiler lore for the Earth on world is they um, buried a series of magical batteries that are called locus, locus or loci mm -hmm. around the globe in a, in a, in a matrix or a lattice, um, which may or may not, you know, either have been put along the ley lines or were the for the source of the ley lines, you know, they could tie into that. But there were this network of these magical batteries around the globe and they enacted this ritual. And on the island of Thera, there's these three pillars of orichalcum, which is this very magical metal mm -hmm. um, that has caused the magic level to, to sustain. And in Bar Save at War, one of the things we discover is that Vivain sits on top of one of these locuses. And when the horror cloud gets to Vivain, the big horror magic and the big power magic battery kind of don't mix and, and it explodes in a bad magical thing. And this is why it would have been the city undead. It kills all the people, but, but there's so much magic, maybe they come back to life. And, um, and so, um, and we even toyed with the idea that the, during the war, the Theron magicians, and I think this might be in the final product, basically channel extra big pulses of magic to sky point that the Therans use in crazy to create these big magic laser cannons to yeah. shoot the sky ship airships out of the sky and you know very climactic um but so one of these loci is is there one is probably under power length one is probably under the wastes and one theory is that the one of the waste got corrupted and that's what's caused the ash um we never established any others and we you know in my time publishing we never published anything that said it was even there because we never got to publish bar save a war Right. So, but that's the sort of the premise is that there's this network of these magical batteries around the globe. Um, and what he means about the coming cataclysm, I think, is at some point, uh, at some point in the Earth on timeline, who knows how, how far away, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands of years in the future. I mean, there's about two, there's less than 2,000 years left before the magic cycle would have ended. But so hundreds of years in the future, at some point, the magic level in the Earth on world is going to crash to nothing. Big explosion. And basically the Therans are going to learn that you don't mess with Mother Nature. You can't, even the most powerful magic in the world can't stop this magic cycle from cycling down, up and down. So when that happens, it's probably going to be a bad time wherever these magical loci are. And I think that's what Sven is talking about, the cataclysm. Um, but aside from probably a locus in par length, probably one in the wastes, maybe one under the bloodwood, you know. Um, we never really got one in Shadow Run, Crater Lake, and Tier 9. Yeah, exactly, right, right. So, and that's one of those things that, you know, Mike Mobile and I sort of talked about, like, well, what are, what are these things? Where are they? Oh, you can use this idea, you know. So, um, we never really got around to saying where they were specifically, mm -hmm. because we didn't have to. Again, and that's sort of this, tell them what you need to tell them, but not anymore. You know, only provide as much detail as is necessary, but as little as possible. Yeah, when you started describing that, and I just recently read the Tierdig Tier Dug or Tier Tangier, yeah, Tier Tangier, right. the Oregon one. I was like, like that's what's in Crater Lake. <laughs> so you just blew my mind there. Right, and I think in the Dragonheart trilogy, there's a scene where they recover one. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, it's been. I'm rereading the uh, one of the the Fossa novels. Right. I haven't right. read them in years. So rereading them now, it's almost like reading new novels again. Right. Uh, so last question is what discipline is your favorite? And if you were an earth on, which one would you most like to be? Oh, wow. This is also by Joel uh, uh, Pippa. So the one I've played the most was an elementalist. But I think my favorite 
probably would be the sword master just because it's fun and cool and they get to do they're a great combination of effective fighter and uh social abilities mm -hmm. um and they're you know they buckle their swash really well and they they're flamboyant and they're just that, that's the one that sort of has appeal even though i haven't really played there are very many of them that's sort of the one that i would gravitate to i think that's the funnest and the coolest of them hey, i've always wanted to play the sky raider but right. <laughs> nothing like jumping out of a sky ship right oh, I know. yeah well, I, 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 sky vikings are just cool <laughs> right okay uh well thank you very much for your time and uh this vast amount of knowledge you shared with us uh, is there anything else you would like to uh, say before we go but uh, no, I mean, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking. I, I, as you can tell, I love to talk about this stuff. Um, uh, for those of you who had questions that we didn't get answered, if if you want to pose them on the Earth on Guild, I'll be happy to try to answer them there. Um, I try to, part to participate there too. Um, no, just again, I, I continue to feel honored and flattered that people love the game that I worked on so much. You know, it's a really great feeling. It's very gratifying and satisfying to know that in some small way, I brought some joy to the world in this way. You know, that's a really nice thing to be able to say, you know, that I helped make some people happy creating this weird fantasy game. You know, it might be a silly thing to do, but it's still, you know, if in the end, when you tally up your life, you know, I just, I'm watching The Good Place again. I don't know if you're familiar with that show, but it's one of my favorites. When you tally up the good, you know, I hope to have put some good in the world. And if Earth On is one of the ways I've done that, then I'm very happy to have done so, so. Uh, I think you were very successful with Earth Dawn on that that regard. And uh, <laughs> for all the people out there watching, I'll put the uh, link to the Earth Dawn Guild in the description. And thank you very much for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks so much. Deploying countermeasures now. Intruder detected. That means it's time to go, chummers. And I'll see you again underneath the electron skies after I dealt with this ice.